Oh, Gateway to the Heavens, what's this all about? This is the first book of five that I'm writing in the Gateway series. And initially, I uh, was just looking at the basic shapes, squares, circles, triangles, crosses, and spirals, um, and how they related to ideas that had no boundaries, such as space and time and consciousness, because those are concepts. They can be any, for example, space can be any shape that you want it to be and I'm an artist as well, so I was looking at how I could actually use those basic geometric shapes to represent those ideas in art. And I came up with a very simple combination of geometric shapes, this one here, which I called, well, I didn't actually have a name for it, but I thought, yay, Eureka, this is it. I've discovered the, the code of reality, and this is, summarizes those key concepts, the, the, the main fundamental aspects of reality that we take for granted. And then a couple of weeks later, I came across yantras, which are Asian art forms based on geometry. And they have the same, exactly the same principles behind them. And they're known as thought forms. They're essentially geometric models that you connect into with the mind to raise your consciousness, to get to know things like space and time better. And the most basic, the most profound of those, and the oldest one, is known as the Sri Yantra and that translates as Gateway to the Heavens. And because there's so many similarities, that's how I came up with the book title. These uh, basic shapes have, what I do in this book is I look at how they structure reality. Geometry is a universal language across all of the disciplines and across all of the cultures. A square is a square wherever you go, unlike color, which has variations. And I look at each of the shapes and how they relate to time and space and being and then I also look at them as symbols and also as tools vehicles for doing things so we use geometry when we're constructing anything like this shot for example here but also how they're used as sacred tools and that's where sacred geometry comes into it because it's the intent which is important um, versus mundane geometry where you're just using it to build something construct something like a chair and it's very functional so I look at the, each shape individually, what they mean and what they do, permutations and combinations of, sh of the shapes, like the square with the circle and the triangle with the circle, etc., and then how they work together as this group called the Gateway to the Heavens. Um, I also look at them as the cornerstones of spirituality, because from ancient times, from the very first time that we actually started to draw on rock faces, petroglyphs, very simple spirals and circles within circles. Geometric shapes have been revered as something that's very powerful and very sacred. And then they've been employed in the construction of temples and all sorts of other things over many generations and it's become much more complicated. And they have a, each of them has a spiritual message that relates to the cornerstones of what spiritual, spirituality is all about. For example, the square is about being grounded and the circle is about being in the moment. And the key of all of them is the centre, the centre of each of the shapes. So the centre of the circle is the moment, and time revolves around us. The centre of the square is being here and being present in space in a particular location. Uh, the centre of the triangles is I am, identity, sentience, being aware that you exist in space and time. So they have, even though they're very basic and we take them for granted, they have very important purposes and they also have very important um, significance in our life if we choose to recognize them and then to employ them deliberately because of what they do. So I do look at the nature of the mind and the power of consciousness as well in this book. And as I said, it's the first one. Uh, the second book is called The Hidden Geometry of Life and that's about the creative process. So I look at uh, this as a vehicle for co-creation. Going back to, again, to something very profound that happened to humans many thousands of years ago, and that was uh, the development of our imagination. Because with our imagination, we're able to form image, images within our mind and to also to pose questions like where, when, who, what, and to see beyond the physical parameters of our environment. And by forming those images in our mind, the next step was to actually share those with other people. And from those humble beginnings, those basic petroglyphs, where we started to record things that we noticed and ideas that we had, all of our symbolic systems have originated. Music, mathematics, languages, etc. Vehicles for expressing our inner worlds with each other. 
And also, as by doing so, by sharing and by communicating, we raise ourselves evolve because we don't have to keep repeating lessons, if you like. Uh, because points are actually very, very fragile, <coughs> and they break off very easily. And uh, yeah. things tend to revert to the sphere. For example, like a very rough stone that's in water, and it's moved around and buffeted around, and it turns into a very small pebble. And that's why on a very large scale, you tend to only see spheres and spirals. But on a very, very minute scale, when you go down to the microscopic level, you see all these beautiful stellations and, and um, things. But how often do you see a triangle and our scale of existence and our levels of being? Not very often. So how come we know what a triangle is and we use it intuitively in various ways symbolically without actually seeing it around us? And this is where the mind is so insignificant and the common access to archetypes that we seem to have and the use of those across all the different cultures in the same way. And I try to tell, I, I focus on the basic shapes because they are really fundamentally the most important ones and they allow these constructs of reality to exist so that it allows the idea of time to exist for us to exist within time and for us to actually communicate about time to represent the idea of time for example in clock faces and to work with circles and recognizing what they do in our community and in a sacred way and that's why for example we used to move in circles around something in the center like a fire or an elder intuitively with the beat of a drum or something like that because we were sharing that moment in time and experience, heightening that experience and it's why we use it in our vocabulary for example I'm just focusing on the circle here work circles, social circles, knitting circles when we're with a group of people for example the dynamic of the circle is here even though we're not actually sitting in the circle because we're sharing a particular event in time and um, from different points of view, which is what the triangle is all about and triangulation. Squares. Squares are a fixed energy and we know that as well. Because where circles rotate and move around and can go anywhere that they want to, Squares, a square box. We can, we can put our shoes into a rectangular box, for example. And squares are all to do with being here. Now, so people understand the idea of the moment and the past is gone and the future is something that we imagine as well. And there's only this ever presence in an infinitesimally small point of time. But there's also only one here. Because if I'm standing here now and I look over there, that there is an illusion created by light. Because as I move around, I carry my gateway to the heavens, I carry this model with me that allows me to think and exist and perceive the constructs of space and time and to perceive a reality around me and the ideas that are there. But if I go over there, sorry, I'm moving, moving camera, I'm actually still here. I can never get actually there because I carry here as I move along. And it's very difficult for people to understand that they, they're, we're all sharing the same here, but we're all doing so from different points of view, and that's where the triangle comes into the equation. The triangle is about the eyes, the three eyes, a window onto reality, and how we perceive things. And the middle of the triangle is just pure I am. And that perception of sentience is quite significant because to be sentient means you perceive yourself in reality relative to other things. So anything with eyes has that ability. And um, very often you'll see symbolically an eye within a triangle representing the soul. <laughs> so the circle, square and triangle, those three things construct space, time and the perception of what it is to be. The middle of them is here, now, I am, or I am here, now. So they fundamentally allow something that is incredibly potent and powerful. Without them, you wouldn't be able to think that. You wouldn't be able to be it. You wouldn't be able to communicate it. And you wouldn't be able to represent it. And that's the three main ones. I also touch on the spiral, which is the life force, and the cross, which 
is X, essentially X, and X marks the spot. It reminds you to get into your centre, to get to, to the centre, to really inhabit, to be consciously inhabit your I am here now. And uh, the spiral is what takes you there. It's the spiral path. It's the life force that binds all of us and which animates us as well, because the other concepts are very static. So that is essentially it in a nutshell. It ended up being the titles because of translation issues. Um, my aha, what was my, my, my aha moment? Right. It was actually standing at a washing, washing up. And uh, I was just in a daydream mode, really, thinking about uh, uh, ideas that don't have any boundaries. I thought, well, how would you represent them? And I started to think about geometric shapes. And it's kind of, I did a mathematics degree, but I also am an artist. But interestingly enough, my maths degree never did geometry in it. So it's quite bizarre. I'm very interested in the visual side of geometry. I do touch on maths, but I do not get into the complicated mathematics because the visual language is something that everybody can understand and can embrace. And then I started to have very strange lucid dreaming is the best way of describing it. I'd just be lying in bed thinking about these ideas. And suddenly I no was noticing that certain letters related to specific shapes, like S's to the spiral, and words that started those describe the attributes of those shapes and how they, what they facilitated, facilitated, if you like. And this was about, I think it was, 20, 18 years ago, I think it was. Uh, so that got me going, and I thought it would take me a year, and here I am, 18 years later. The heat is getting to my brain. Um, three, six, and nine work together as a trinity. Two, four, and eight work together, and that's about an expansive thing. So three, six, and nine. Three is creation, because the two male and female principles create the third. Six is fertility and balance, so you have two triangles superimposing on each other. And nine is the horizon number. It's the, the man that has learnt all their lessons. And um, so they all relate to the process of becoming, so that you create something, and then you have fertility, and then you have a process of learning and development, and you raise your consciousness. So you'll find that those three, six, and nine are used a lot in belief systems in relation to anything to do which describes different attributes of those things, being and becoming. So this is why you have trinities representing things like Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And um, they are three, those three numbers are revered across all different cultures in relation to that. Nine is very often related to the pinnacles of the being. So you have nine heavenly planes on a ninth heaven, you know, things like that. So, because but when you get to nine, you can't get quite beyond nine. When you've gone, you get to ten, and ten is one and zero again. So, all the numbers between naught, one, and ten describe all the attributes of reality. So, I, I relate it to fertility, fecundity, and um, the expansive process of creating and generating forms of life. The best example of six is the snowflake, because it's the snowflake is all about, based around the number six, which is a finite concept, and yet in, every single f snowflake is unique and different, and just as we are. So it has that generative, fertile aspect to it. Does that answer your question? Where things are chaotic, into that centre, into the calm place where you can reflect, meditate, and gain an insight into you, where you are now, and your condition of being, and then you come back out again into reality, where you bring your lessons with you and then apply them. And it's the same principle in the medicine wheel, Native American medicine wheel, where you go into the middle and you're learning the lessons of the directions. The dawn of our imagination is the pivotal point, but we have no idea what, what that point happened. The first recorded insights of the mind were the petroglyphs. And those are universal. And then every single culture has embraced those, has them within, because language and mathematics and shape is a universal language. So every single culture has explored geometry and employed geometry in many ways and in quite complex ways. And it's something that we have to seem to, we have to, see, seem to keep relearning the meaning of. It's not taught in school, this language of 
numbers and shape for some reason. Um, so the interesting thing about us as a species, because you mentioned the microscope, is that we're the perfect size for the Earth and for using all the elements like air, water, fire to create things. And we have a basic senses, our five senses, and we've extended those by creating things like microscopes, telescopes, telephones, computers, so that we can physically, physically perceive more in terms of smaller things and larger things using our imaginations and these various tools that we constructed. That doesn't necessarily mean that we look at them from a spiritual point of view, but it's quite fascinating that if we were any bigger, we wouldn't be able to do that. If we were the size of an elephant, we'd have to have massive legs because of the force of gravity to support us. If we were as small as, say, an ant or a fly, then you start to stick to the surface of what you're sitting on. Also, the perception of those creatures will be completely different to ours. So a fly will see everything potentially in a very two-dimensional way because they're having to move up and down. They wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to conceive of planets. An elephant can't make the tools that we've created. So can an elephant conceive of the cycles of the moon and the planet and things? Unlikely. We are the perfect size perfect shape. Our minds have developed in perfect way. It's quite a phenomenal miracle that we are what we are and in particular our, um, our imagination and tool set that we have. So you, well, your point is quite interesting because people of the ages and particularly the Vedics in a, um, um, India and also Hebrews and their use of sound and things as well they understood ideas that we only have noticed through tools here and now. So, how incredible is that? I don't know. Through it, and also the same with dowsing. And uh, you have the very masculine garden designs where it's all very square or rest of it, and then there's very more feminine ones where it's all about spirals and motion and all of that. And quite a lot of garden and garden designers are getting into sacred geometry these days and recognising the concept of sacred space and actually how a garden, because you're part of nature, can affect you quite emotionally, quite powerfully, if you're laying things out in a certain way and taking people through it and the natural resources that are used as well. And again, the ancients recognised that, that the stones that are used, the crystals, all have their own vibration, particular plants, particular trees, um, all have an effect on us as individuals when we become part of them. <laughs> Gets disrupted occasionally, because there's always chaos in there as well. <laughs> that's the beauty of chaos. And that's, that's um, chaos is really interesting, the idea that there's always a flaw in things. And this is what is so phenomenal, because the laws of mathematics and the laws of geometry are very precise. And yet there's always slight flaws which create the variety and the variation in things. And that's best illustrated in ensos, which are uh, Japanese, Japanese art, where they will sit and meditate for hours. And they have their three tools, the paintbrush, art and the paper. And then they will paint a circle in one sweep. And a complete circle is perfection, but they always leave a slight gap to represent that slight imperfection. And they believe that as they paint that, they're capturing the, capturing the consciousness of the artist in that moment in time, and fusing it in the, in the circle. I have taught people in, in uh, the past, because it, when you're painting anything and you're drawing, the nature of you is fused into that. So if you're angry and frustrated, your painting will hold that anger and frustration within it. And a very good exercise to do is to draw three circles as a group. And in one of them, not tell anybody, one of them to do it just academically, as if you sat in a classroom and you're just drawing a circle. So there'll be nothing in that circle, it'll be empty. Another one where you're angry inside, extremely angry, so think of an angry. And the third one where you connect into spirit and just imagine yourself as light, and light coming through your paintbrush into the, into the circle. And then if you all pass your hands over them, you will actually feel energetically the difference between those three circles. It's quite an interesting exercise.